Hi all. Today we're talking about racism, visible and invisible identities, and unpaid care work. I'm going to start with racism. In thinking about the implicit associations that people have in their head, the stereotypes that they've learned about different groups of people. Something to think about when we're talking about visible identities is that what matters is the way that people perceive you. It's not actually the identity that you hold, but the way that people read you that matters. And so if you have an identity that is read specifically in one way, if you are very visibly a person of color, people will interact with you based on the ideas that they have about this group. The prejudice and the preconceived notions affect the way that they read you and the way that they interact with you. It's not something that can be taken off. And these uh, prejudices are usually not conscious. So if we are uh, encouraged to think about people of color as dangerous and criminal, it's not surprising that folks would get nervous and jumpy when they're around people of color because that's a message that we've been fed. We've all been fed this message. Uh, what we can start to do is start to recognize the messages that we've learned and actively try to pull them out. When we look at um, the not just the small interpersonal interactions but also the way that racism shows up in structures we want to think about all the different uh, benefits that we've assigned to whiteness so for example um, practices like redlining in which a city was divided up and pretty much zoned into black and white um, and folks of color were only allowed to live in one neighborhood that was artificially kept economically depressed, so bank loans wouldn't go to this area. Um, when we talk about the way that voter suppression has been historically racist, and still is, um, even the most recent voting suppression laws have to do with folks of color and low-income folks. So we start to move from just interpersonal interactions to also noticing the way that structures reinforce this dynamic. Um, when we think about the non-visible identities, these are identities that you might hold that people cannot read on you quickly. Uh, and this is important because the dynamic changes. When we're, when we're thinking about visible identities, that can never not be a part of an interaction. And that constancy is really draining. You can never know if the person who just treated you badly at the bank or at the store was doing it based on their racism or if it was just having to do with what happened in their day and they were having a cranky day. Um, that constancy is really draining because you can never be off. You can never have a rest from it. That's always part of the way that you are perceived in the world. Um, on the other hand, the non-visible identities, we can talk about passing privilege. And so if people can read you as part of the dominant group, not part of the oppressed group, they can give you benefits um, that can help you out throughout your day. Um, they can support you in different ways. The downside to this is that information management becomes crucial. Who knows? What do they know? When do I tell them? Uh, how do I hide this? Uh, do I hide this? This in itself is draining in a different way. Um, having to keep story straight and figure out who knows what they know about you. It's also problematic because um, you won't know who your people are. I can't walk into a room and know who's queer because it's a non-visible identity. So I don't know who can back me up in case of need. Um, I don't even know who to reach out to. And so uh, the non-visible identities sometimes do things like having visible markers. So I wear my pretty rainbow ring. That makes me very happy every day. And it's a big accomplishment for me to be at a place where I can have a marker of queerness directly on my body. Um, so the dynamics are different and we want to kind of think of the ways that these patterns might be similar. So for example, since racism um, <clears throat> and skin tone is a visible identity, what could it have in common with sexism, which is often a visible identity as well. We can usually read who is presenting as a woman in a space and so we, as we perceive them, we interact with them. And so could it be that the stereotypes about women being dumb or bad at math be playing into this interaction? Um, when we're talking about non-visible identities, we might talk, for example, about psychiatric diagnoses as a non-visible identity and information management being a really big part of how you show up in the world. Who knows? What do, I, what do they know? Who, are, who is around me who also shares this identity? We're switching over for a minute into unpaid care work and thinking about the ways that we um, all benefit as a society from this care work. If, um, and this is the case, I won't be having children. 
And if we all agreed that having children was too much of a hassle and we all decided that we really didn't want to do it because it just wasn't a good gig, um, we would have a problem in that every society is going to need young people. We need all kinds of people of all kinds of ages. As we age, so even if it's from a very selfish perspective, I won't be having children, but I'm going to need some younger folks by the time I'm older. By the time I'm 60, I won't be the one planting the food. I will need somebody else to drive that tractor and pull those potatoes out. And so I'm going to benefit from the fact that somebody is having children right now and raising them. And I don't feel comfortable mooching off of somebody else's labor and benefiting, benefiting from it and not actually paying them for that work. We've come to think about care work as not work. Um, we have the expectation that everybody should be able to be autonomous. That's kind of how we've designed a society, is everybody should be autonomous and be able to take care of themselves. The thing is, there's many, many humans who need a lot of support. It can be very small humans who need help, everything from feeding themselves to cleaning themselves. Uh, it can be medium-sized humans who need support in learning skills. It can be much older humans who need uh, help uh, with uh, basic life skills, like, again, feeding themselves and um, uh, clothing themselves. And it can be adult humans who need extra care and support. Uh, there are some plenty of adult humans through disability and different life conditions who need extra support in doing basic life skills. Um, but since we've got the expectation that everybody should be able to take care of themselves, we kind of shirk care work and consider it to be less important um, there's a lot of messages that encourage this notion. We think of care work as unskilled. And when we say that work is unskilled, we're not willing to pay for it. So uh, we would say, yeah, anybody can load a dishwasher. That's not that big of a deal. Anybody can do a load of laundry. That's not that big of a deal. We really don't need to be paying extra for this work because it's unskilled. And that's problematic because when we think of all the work that goes into keeping humans well through cleaning, or uh, cooking, or caretaking, or soothing. This is really amazing, important work, and incredibly complex. It is really hard to do all of the things at once and do them well. Care work is particularly problematic because when it's done really well, when your biggest goal is to have it be unnoticeable. When it's done really, really well, everything just kind of flows. The house is clean, everybody's fed, humans are relatively clean and well and happy. So the best you can strive for is to have it be unnoticeable. Uh, when things go bad is when you start noticing all of the work that goes into keeping everybody being well. Uh, the dishes pile up, there's no food, the clothes are dirty. So one of the problems we have in recognizing care work as work is that it kind of vanishes and disappears. When it's done well, it just goes away. And another problem is the fact that this is repetitive work that doesn't have accumulation that's easily noticeable. Like, if you were to be able to take all of a family's dishes and stack them up, you'd be able to notice that it's a ton of work to get this done over a week. But since it's done, and then it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated, you won't notice the huge impact that you've had. You don't see a giant stack of dishes. Um, another problem with care work is that um, the urgency makes it very complex. Work. The timing the way that you're doing a lot of multitasking is really complex work. You have to time the baby's nap with the clothing and the ding of the dryer. This is all stuff that's complex that is a skill that's developed over time. Um, the tasks that we often assign typically men in a household are often not as urgent. So you could put off mowing the lawn for a week. You could put off washing the car for a couple weeks. You could put off taking the trash until tomorrow morning. The thing is, there's a lot of tasks that are a lot more urgent. So that baby needs to get fed within the next half an hour, or there's going to be hell to pay. There's going to be screaming and crying, and that's going to be four hours of trying to calm the baby down. So the urgency of the tasks itself is really important as we're thinking about the complexity of this work. Uh, we're taught to think of care work as natural and instinctive and um, something that is, again, unskilled. And we'll say women are natural caretakers. This is something that comes very easily to them. And so, therefore, this shouldn't be work that is paid. We're also taught to think about um, this as work that's done out of love. And at, love is absolutely a part of caretaking, and emotional connection is very, very important. But even if we leave that equation out of it, um, 
if we just think about the ways that we need to present ourselves in terms of affection, um, we are taught to think of this as love work, therefore it should be unpaid work. Uh, and that's problematic because it is really, really hard work. And as you start thinking about the exercise that you did and thinking about um, all the work that goes into getting a human from newborn to 20 year old that's ready to work, uh, if we do like a real numbers figuring out, I've had students come up with a, a $700,000 figure, which would be 35K a year for uh, 20 years of work. Um, I've had students come up with a million too. I've had students come up with $3 million uh, when I think about those 20 years of work. If you think about all the work that goes into it and actually try to pile it up and put a number on it, we start to recognize that it's a ton of work. And we, if we start to think about who is doing this work and not getting paid for it, we can see that systematically, consistently, all over the world, it's women who are assigned this task. Again, there's exceptions and things are changing. And yet when we do time use service, even today, it's really overwhelmingly women that are doing this work. So how is it that we get convinced to do this work for free when it's absolutely crucial to the survival of the species? It's really, really hard work and it takes a ton of time. If we start to think about all these patterns, it's really problematic. Um, Another thing that keeps us from recognizing this as important, valuable work is that we don't have kind of a product to point to. And again, the stack of dishes. Uh, when you're an architect, you can point to the building and say, I did that. That's pretty amazing. When you're a care worker, you get to say, uh, today I did nothing. And you can see a house that kind of looks empty and well taken care of. Um, we want to think about the ways that we could support these care workers in their work as a society. So as a member of society, again, I'm not doing that care work, but since I benefit from it, I want to make sure that I'm not mooching from it. So the structures that we need to change in society for care workers to be well, we would have to think about things like maternity leave and how long that should be. The fact that the U.S. is one of two countries in the world that do not offer paid maternity leave. The other one is Papua New Guinea everywhere else in the world they have this. It's bad enough that when I teach outside of the US, when I teach in Costa Rica and Ecuador and Colombia, people don't believe this. They think I'm confused. They actually kind of brush me off. I tell them, you know, in the US they don't have paid maternity leave. They go, nah, that couldn't possibly be. Most societies in the world have figured out that when somebody creates a human and takes it out of their body, they're probably going to need a little bit of rest and that their resting is actually really good for all of us as a society. Um, when mothers and children can spend some time together, they can recover, their physical health is off to a better start, their emotional health is off to a much better start. When we consider that in Oregon, there's a law that says that you cannot sell puppies that are less than eight weeks old. That law is in place to make sure that those pop puppies are off to a good start and off to a healthy start. And yet, as a society, we're willing to force humans to give up a newborn human within days of its birth. That's bad for us all around, even if I were to take it from a very selfish perspective, not even thinking about that baby and that adult. Um, it's really bad for me when somebody has to give up a one week old because they don't have the time to heal and bond and do well and uh, establish breastfeeding and get uh, a good immunity boost. Um, there is many societies in which caretaking is valued and anybody who's doing caretaking for an under six year old is getting paid a stipend from which they can live and recognizing that this is work that requires an incredible amount of hours and forcing somebody to do care work and paid work at the same time for a specific period is a really bad idea. And so as a society, they've gotten themselves organized and saying, we're going to have paid parental leave until not just six weeks, but we might make it even six years. Um, and let me double check if I'm skipping anything. Oh, yes. Um, in terms of structures, if we were to think about good structures that could support caretaking, I've mentioned paid parental leave, um, but also having decent uh, daycare. 
So having a place where you can take a break as a care worker and uh, leave your child so that you can do go do other adult errands like grocery shopping or the bank or having a minute to yourself. Uh, if parents had a good place that they can depend on leaving children for a few hours that was clean and healthy and affordable, that would make a really big difference in their job as care workers. Being able to take a break is something that we take for granted at work. Being able to take a vacation is something we take for granted at work. And these care workers usually never get an access to that rest. And, oh yes, um, in thinking about equally shared parenting, we want to think about the ways that having a group project that is uh, really tied to over-specialization is problematic. So when you have only one adult human who is capable of feeding the small human and only one adult human that is capable of gathering money, we have a problem because you're dependent on both of those humans to be available at all times. And it's a really vulnerable system because if one of them goes missing, then you don't have a way of picking up that task. You can't switch roles easily. You can't be flexible. It can't be that the um, the non-caretaking parent uh, is able to put the baby down to sleep. She never goes to sleep when I put her down. She won't eat broccoli when I feed it to her. Why don't you do it? We have over-specialization and it's problematic because if anything were to go wrong, things are too vulnerable. Um, we also can't spot each other. We can't take over and support each other in, in our work. So these are some of the things that we want to consider as we think about care work as very important and valuable to a society. Have a good week.